So, uh, I would like to start welcoming you all to the 52nd webinar of the Graduate Program in Physics of the Federal University of Pará in Amazonia, Brazil. I ask everyone to kindly leave the cameras and microphones turned off, except for the moment you're going to speak. Questions will be allowed after the webinar, unless otherwise requested by the speaker. The questions can be asked using the chat, both in this virtual room and in YouTube. Today, we have the honor to listen to Professor Richard McFadden Martin, who obtained his PhD in physics from the University of Chicago in 1969 after earning a science bachelor in engineering physics from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville in 1964. He worked as a member of the technical staff at Bell Labs and then as a principal scientist at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center and a consulting professor at Stanford University. He joined the physics faculty at the University of Illinois in 1988. In 2007, he retired from the University of Illinois. He now lives in Palo Alto and is an adjunct professor at the Department of Applied Physics at Stanford. His book, Electronic Structure, Basic Theory and Practical Methods, Cambridge University Press 2004, has become a standard in the field adopted worldwide, including Brazil. It has been translated into Japanese in two volumes in 2010 and 12, devoted primarily to density functional methods. This book was reprinted in 2005 and 8, and a new edition has been published in 2020. His other book, Interacting Electrons, written with co-authors David Sepperly and Lucia Reining, was published in 2016 and is devoted to the most widely used many-body methods. Among the research honors received by Professor Richard Martin, I can mention the Senior Research Fellow Prize at Alexander Humboldt Foundation in 1994-95, Fellow of the American Association for the, the Advancement of Science in 1996, Sabbatical Scholar Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in 2000-2001, General Counselor of the American Physics Society in 2004, and CU International Humanitarian Award in 2005. In recent years, Professor Martin has been devoted to the advancement of research opportunities for scientists in less developed countries, and he's a chair of the International Advis Advisory Committee of African School for Electronic Structure Methods and Applications, and an organizer of the US-Africa Initiative for e Electronic Structure. In recognition to these contributions, his, this year he was made fellow of the South African Institute of Physics. But we are here today to listen to Professor Richard Martin, so that I won't keep you waiting longer with this introduction. So Professor Martin, thank you again very much for having accepted our invitation. And from this moment on, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to give a lecture in this uh, series that you have organized so well. Uh, it, I have a question first. Is it possible for me to see myself while doing this presentation? Professor, I'm afraid not. In this oh, mode, okay. uh, then, this is for you not to get any kind of disturbances of videos and chats. Okay. That's the way it is. Sorry then for tell that. Tell me if somehow I get off the screen or anything like that. <laughs> for sure. Okay, so it's a pleasure again. And there. So. Why is that I call it the grand challenge and useful? It is a grand challenge because the many body interacting electron problem is one of the deep fundamental challenges in physics, and it has exciting new phenomena and discoveries essentially every year. And it has important applications. The theory has gotten good enough that it actually uh, can be used for realistic problems and it has a big effect in all areas of science and technology now. And that means it must be quantitatively accurate. How can we possibly expect to understand and calculate properties of such a difficult problem and to do it accurately enough to be uh, really useful? The major breakthrough was density functional theory. This is what's made possible the quantitative calculations that have revolutionized the field, made the theory go right along with the experiment and, and having big effects uh, nowadays. It's useful. The 
Uh, but the many body problem presents many more challenges that are not answered by density functional theory directly. So we need guiding principles to navigate the difficult issues. I'm putting up something that I've really been involved in very much the last few years. And uh, that was mentioned already uh, uh, by in the introduction. But I want to emphasize that this is working together with people around the globe. And it's been a pleasure to work with some people from Brazil. For example, uh, Renata Winskovich, uh, originally from Brazil, is one of the leaders of this uh, US AFRI, that means the US Africa Initiative, uh, and active in assessment. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it's meant to involve people everywhere in three-way connections with Brazil. Two-way and three-way would be just, you know, our super. Uh, so an outline of what I want to say is, I'd like to say something about the history of the electronic structure starting in the earliest days. And um, uh, because that's so important and, and the, the, the fact that it's such an, an interesting problem and a fundamental problem. And the problem of interacting electrons and the, the landmark developments of Cohn and Cham and, and Hohenberg and Cohn in the 60s. The, 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 the basic thing that's of, uh, that determines how, how well it works is the exchange correlation functionals. And of course, that must be um, uh, part of the talk. So a few ex selected examples. I just will not even try to make any kind of an, an extensive survey of what's done because it's so much. And a few of the advances beyond the original Cone-Sham approach. And if there's time, uh, at the end, I want to talk about some things that relate to strongly correlated systems. And I would say some misconceptions that are around. And I want to point to some guiding principles for interpreting calculations applied to difficult problems. So a bit of history. Here's a timeline at the, at the bottom that I'm going to keep updating uh, through a little bit of the history. Uh, electrons were important from the early days of quantum mechanics. Of course, starting in 1900, uh, uh, almost this week, uh, 1900 was the uh, publication of the paper by Planck about the quantization, uh, or rather I should say, the law of, of um, emission that then turned into an important part of understanding quanta and the work of Einstein and, and um, Bohr and others. But I'd like to start then with the history that it was particularly for the electron and the work of Louis de Broglie was, was uh, last week, 98 years ago, uh, was the publication of the first paper. And this was part of his thesis, and which was not, not actually defended until the next year. And one of the key papers was in Analyte de Physique in 1925. This, uh, this started a wave of work. And uh, Schrodinger in particular, the invented the Schrodinger equation, uh, was already done in 1925. And it was just amazing how quickly things went. The Pauli exclusion principle in 1925, Fermi statistics, 26, Thomas Fermi approximation in 1927. And I'd like to mention particularly uh, Paul de Rock. His first paper uh, was on quantum, the first paper on quantum mechanics was in 1926 when he was age 24. Uh, de Rock had actually gotten a degree in electrical engineering. And uh, it was a difficult time to get jobs, and he didn't get a job. But in addition, if you look at some of the descriptions of his personality, you can see why it was difficult for him to get a job in engineering. And we are really fortunate that he didn't. He proposed the first density functional in 1928. The Dirac equation that uh, for relativistic quantum mechanics already in 1928 was the basis of everything that we do now uh, in, in our field. And already in 1930, age 28, he had published the book Principles of Quantum Mechanics. That's, that's a, a beautiful uh, book that still sh should be read today. I have a copy and, and use it. 
the block theorem was already in 1928. And so already in the 20s, the, there was work like the numerical solution of uh, exact, numerically exact solution for two electron problem in helium by Hillerus. And Hartree had shown how to do the approximate solutions for many electrons and atoms with using an approach that was where each electron was moving independently in an effective potential. Since it's spherically symmetric, it becomes a radial equation for, for each of the electron wave functions that viewed as independent. Uh, and it could be done on a hand calculator in the 20s. DR went on to be one of the pioneers of, of uh, early computation, but his father, a businessman, uh, did many of the actual calculations at the time. So already in the 20s, the, the theory for independent particles was well understood. The Schrodinger equation and for uh, from the exclusion principle for n fermions in the ground state, you just sum over n wave function squared, and each of the wave functions is calculated by uh, a single body Schrodinger equation. And we know what to do on a solid. So for, whoops, I shouldn't have done that yet. So the, from the block theorem, we know uh, how to use the group theory and the that the, I, the states are eigenfunctions of, of momentum, so we can solve for infinite um, crystals in um, uh, with independent particle approximations and and it's something that's really doable however the key problem is what is the potential that goes in the equation and it's got to contain some effects of electron electron interactions and the total energy has to take into account effects of the electron electron interactions so Already in the 30s, essentially the methods for independent particles were developed, but not yet. Um, well, actually, I shouldn't take, say that quite right. So in the 19, uh, the independent particle methods, Harter Fock was in 1930. Bigner and Seitz did quantitative calculations for sodium already in 1933 and 35. I started to say that almost uh, none of the work involved the, uh, the total energy of the electrons directly, but that was not right. Already with very wise ideas, Wigner and Seitz did some very good approximations in 1930s that, that uh, were pretty accurate for the total energy of sodium. Slater did calculations for sodium also and proposed the augmented plane wave method already in 1937. Of course, Bloch used uh, tight binding and Jones and Mott and Skinner turned it into a, a real uh, full method involving linear combinations of atomic orbitals. Pseudopotentials, very close to the modern form, were already used by Fermi and Hellman in, the, in 34 and 35. There was work by Tam on surface states, but I'd like to mention particularly the ones by uh, Shockley in 1939 that was done in such a way that it was a clear forerunner for topological insulators. Well, our field really has had a big of effect. The first understanding of the semiconductors was the 30s, and then in the 40s, there was the actual practical development of the transistor. Of the three people who got the Nobel Prize for inventing the transistor, two were, were directly from our field. Bardeen was a student of Wigner, and he did his thesis on the Fermi surface of a metal in 1935. Shockley was a student of Slater, and he did his thesis on the electronic band structure of sodium chloride in 1936. So we have a challenge to live up to ourselves. So 1950s was the first use of electronic computers. Uh, here's an example by Frank Herman in, um, in uh, early 1950s, who was at IBM and used the computers at IBM. So in, in fact, as it turns out, the, the, um, the actual calculations were, were not correct. They got the wrong uh, positions uh, for the conduction bands in, in germanium. And that's because it was an independent 
electron approximation and the approximation for the potential was just not good enough. There's an interesting story behind this as well. Hartree's father did a lot of calculations. Well, Herman's mother did calculations before the computers were available. And Herman uh, said that if uh, after he was able to do the calculations on the computer, he went back to check and he never found the mistake done by his mother. OK, so back to the original problem. What about the grand challenge of interacting electrons? Why is it hard? So if in the 1920s, Hitler said already tackled the problem of two electrons, which is a six dimensional equations. Uh, two, two electrons each in three dimensions. So what if we have three or 100 or 10 to the 23rd? Uh, the Bloch theorem works for independent electrons, but they're all coupled if, 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 the, interact, if the electrons are interacting. So it isn't a simple uh, problem of just, you know, just using the uh, Bloch theorem and adding up uh, uh, the independent particle wave functions. The problem scales exponentially with a number. If we can do electrons uh, number like tw 11 today, then tomorrow well, means a few years, we could do 12. Uh, so of course, there's some wonderful methods developed in chemistry that, that reduce this uh, exponential scaling dramatically, but still they're limited to rather small problems. So the landmark years for uh, what can be done in condensed matter physics or in molecules that are very large was uh, 1964 and 65. That was the dates for Hohenberg and Cham's work. And it was just right time to do it because the independent particle methods were around, the, the computers were on the verge of being able to solve complicated problems so the methods could be used and they gave a way to uh, to actually use the methods to, which, to address the interacting electron problem. It's also interesting that those were exactly the years where the, the big developments on the other most widely used methods for solids were done. The GW approximation using many-body perturbation theory was 1964 by Hedin. Uh, based on work that had been done the previous decades, but put together in a particular way by Hadeen that's used today. Quantum Monte Carlo, the first calculations were in 1964 by uh, Bill McMillan, a student of Bardeen. He was at the University of Illinois, and he did the calculations on computer that he put together in the basement of his home. So that uses random sampling to treat many body problems. So let's go back to the real original full problem. It's the Hamiltonian is kinetic energy electrons, the interaction of the electrons with the nuclei or with other external potentials, um, the electron-electron uh, interactions, which is of course the hard part of the problem. The kinetic energy of the nuclei is, is quite small and for, um, for our present purposes, and so we just simply omit it, and it can be put in later uh, by perturbation theory. The interaction between the nuclei is, is a, uh, as long as the nuclei are treated as classical, it's just additive terms. So uh, it must, must be included in the end, but it's not part of the, the hard part of the uh, electron problem. So the basic problem is interacting electrons in an external potential which the external means the nuclei plus anything else that's, that's uh, applied, any other kind of potentials. So what did density functional theory do? It did not give another Hamiltonian. It did not give an approximation to this Hamiltonian. It, it works directly with a real full Hamiltonian. And what it does is to rearrange things in a way that's exceedingly uh, clever and useful. It, the hohenberg cone functional, the hohenberg cone approach is for the total energy, not to develop a new Hamiltonian. It's for the expectation values of the 
the real Hamiltonian, the kinetic energy, the expectation value, the, the uh, total interaction energy, the uh, the uh, thing, everything that's external to the electrons, including the nuclei, is just the function of the density uh, interacting with that potential, and other terms like the interaction between the nuclei that is not important for our purposes. So lumping together the the many body parts of the problem, uh, it gives what's called the hohenberg cone functional, and the interaction with the rest of the world is just uh, this very simple equation that involves the density. So let's talk in the next slide about a, what a functional means. So here I'm just repeating the same equations and, and saying the difficult parts of the problem are all lumped here and then this thing that adds up the kinetic energy and the interaction energy of the, uh, of the electrons and the effect of the rest of the world on the system is only through this uh, equation. That's the uh, interaction that, that depends on the density of the electrons and the external potential. So what's a functional? We know that, that these terms, like the energy or any of the terms, are determined if you know the external potential. That means that if you know the external potential everywhere, at every point in space, then in principle, we can solve the Schrodinger equation and we can know what is the expectation value of the energy, the kinetic energy, and, and the interaction energy. Even though they are very complicated and we can't really solve the equation, we know that they're determined by the external potential. So that means it's a functional of the external potential. The proof that it was a function of the density is what Hohenberg and Cohn did. So their statement was that for a given density, I mean their proof was that for a given density, there is only one unique potential, uh, that is except for a constant, which is arbitrary, for which the ground state density is equal to that chosen density. That means there's a one-to-one -one correspondence of the external potential and the density. And therefore, the ground state density determines the potential, and therefore, the ground state density determines everything. I mean, everything, everything. Now, they have a, a proof by construction that's a very simple, but I don't want to give it. I want to point out that it's really simple to understand. It's just like the equation of state of the solid. We don't know how to actually calculate everything about the in what's going on in a solid, but we do know that the energy and um, uh, is determined by the the volume or by the external pressure that's applied. So we can view the equation of stated functions of uh, pressure and volume, and the generalization to a full potential and density is just a generalization. Um, to this more difficult problem. But in principle, it's just exactly the same mathematics and it's what's called as a Legendre transformation that's known in, in so many areas of physics. Of physics. But the, the, the theorems do nothing about helping us actually calculate anything. The, it just says go back and, and solve the Schrodinger equation to get the result. Was that worth the Nobel Prize? Probably not. What was worth the Nobel Prize was the cone jam idea of construction of an auxiliary system that makes the, the solution actually possible. The, the cone jam, I shouldn't say the solution possible. I should say the uh, formulation of the solution that's exact. Uh, it was the wonderful step and, but then the, the fact that you could make interesting approximations is what was making it the useful step. So the idea was to construct an auxiliary system of non-interacting electrons, I mean real electrons except they don't interact, and include functionals that, that include the effect of interactions in the, act, in the actual system, 
uh, following the general ideas of Hohenberg and Cohn. So the key functional is, is, the, is the, the energy, which is divided into the heart tree energy, which is easy to calculate uh, if you know the density, and all the rest in the ex what's called the exchange correlation energy. But the way the Hohenberg Cohn theorem comes in, it's not in a practical sense, it's in the beautiful sense that we know that whatever it is, it's a function of the density, and it's universal. This idea of universal is, is uh, hard to fathom. It's that the only way the system knew about the, the external world, you know, whether it was in a molecule or a solid, uh, is, is through the potential that, it's, that the electrons find themselves in. And since that's a function of the density, then, then there's some universal function of the density that would work in all possible systems in principle. In principle is the exact, and it would give you the exact uh, density and ground state. And in practice, it makes possible useful approximations. And remember that at this point now, it's, it's the theory of the ground state density and total energy. The Hohenberg Cohn theorem was that everything is determined, but now in the Cohn sham auxiliary system, we're going to make something that's much more practical. And, and what it determines is the ground state density and total energy, and not everything um, uh, just by solving the equations. So for independent particles, it's it's a, uh, we know what the approach will be. We know how to calculate the density. We know how to calculate the kinetic energy. We know how to calculate the heart tree energy, which is just the integral involved in the density and the Coulomb interaction. And we know this extra term for the nuclei nuclei interaction, the potential and the interaction with the external potential and everything else lumped into this exchange correlation term. So uh, all these terms are fully soluble and we're left with the exchange correlation that's uh, exact, but it's unknown. And now the key thing is that we can make approximations and, and it's turned out that one can make very good approximations. So the, the key thing is that the problem has been divided into two parts. One part it needs the many body physics. That is, what is this object called exchange correlation functional? It's determined by the many body problem. And somehow you have to get information about the real many body problem. And, and it, it will always be approximate, but, but that comes from somewhere. Once you have that somewhere, then, then you have all the rest that's basically going to be a doable and uh, independent particle problem. And the doable means that what, what the, the goal was that you would calculate the ground state. So that means you just, you have to minimize the total energy. So you minimize this cone sham energy that was given on the previous slide. And since the wave functions are are the, uh, the variables in an independent particle approximation. You, the, you vary the energy with respect to the wave functions uh, to get the minimum uh, under the constraint that they're orthogonal. And that leads directly to the cone sham equations. The, the independent Schrodinger-like equation that involves a potential given, uh, we call it the cone sham potential. And and that is given by the, in the minimization process, it's the, de the derivative of each of these terms with respect to the density, the external potential or the derivative of the Hartree uh, energy with respect to the, uh, with the density, which is the, just, is the Coulomb potential, the um, derivative of the exchange correlation uh, energy with respect to the density, uh, and that's the hard part of the problem, and that's the part where some approximation needs to be made. But once you've made the approximation, everything follows. So it's a self-consistent set of equations because the, uh, 
the Schrodinger-like equation involves a density, excuse me, involves a potential, and the potential is determined by, by the density, uh, which is a result of this equation. So with a self-consistent loop to arrive at a, at a self-consistent solution, uh, this is now a soluble problem, and it's the famous Kumjam equations. So the eigenvalues are now auxiliary variables. They're not meant to be uh, something physical themselves, but we'll talk about them again uh, in a little later. So what is this exchange correlation energy? If, you, if, if, if there was no interactions, you would just add the energies and you would be done. The difficult part of the problem is these many body effects. And, and there's a nice way to look at it. The idea is that near each electron, there's a reduced probability of finding other electrons. And you'd call that the exchange correlation hole. And it's a well-defined object for the ground state. The exchange is the exclusion principle. That means that uh, electrons of the same spin are pushed apart because they, they, they can't be at the same point at the same time. Correlation works between uh, same spin and, and opposite spin electrons and where the repulsive Coulomb interaction pushes them apart and leads you to finally a reduction of the uh, density of other electrons around any given electron. Here's an example that's isotropic and, an, and it's a, a very simple anisotropic case. And the key thing that's, that makes it all work is that the energy depends only on the spherical average. So what I'd like to do instead of going through uh, details of which functional is which and how well they work, I would like to give you an idea of how it can possibly work. From the very start, um, the, the, the um, proposal by uh, Cohn and Cham was a local density approximation, which is an example of, of using a model system. We use many body results on some model system and then we apply it to the actual system we want to deal with. And their approach was called the local density approximation. Already in 1964 and 65, they had the idea that we could use this model problem and treat the exchange correlation at, at, as a functional, functional the density. And, and at the time, they were pretty good uh, many-body calculations. And now we, we have the essentially exact calculation using Monte Carlo for the exchange correlation uh, energy is a function of the density of a homogeneous gas. And there are better approximations uh, also by model systems like the generalized gradient approximations. And more and more uh, things that uh, approaches that use theory more directly. And, and, uh, and more and more recently, the theory has gotten involved with you know, in a very pretty way. So I encourage you to, to look up um, these uh, what's done and to realize that it's not just sort of hand-wavingly um, grabbing some model system, but this theory behind the, the hybrid functionals, the Vandeville functionals, and others. But now, how did it work? What's the, the an example that shows you how this could possibly work. Here's one I like, particularly from Ola Gunnarsson and co-workers in 1979. This is only the exchange uh, because the correlation is hard to calculate, but the exchange can be calculated exactly in the Hartree-Fock method. And then it turns out that the correlation is, is similar uh, for, for this purpose. So here was the point. In a Hartree-Fock calculation, you can look at a particular point, like here is, we've called it zero to be the position of an electron in the, in the atom. And, and if you look around the atom and look at the exchange, uh, exchange hole, it's mainly back around the nucleus, which is, uh, uh, in this particular case, is you know, you know, at, at this point, relative to this position that's been assigned to be zero. And, and it's 
the uh, exchange hole is mainly uh, back around the nucleus because that's where the other electrons are. The local density approximation is is uh, nothing like that. It's 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 uh, isotropic since the home it's a homogeneous system, so it's the same on the left and right. Um, and I think you would agree this is the dotted line is not a very good approximation to the solid line. But remember, the energy involves only the spherical average, and and if you look at the radial uh, uh, distribution of this exchange hole, this would be the the um, density of that that hole per uh, per unit radius. Uh, this is the exact result from Archivac, and this is the local density approximation. And I think you might see that that's a pretty good approximation. And this is the bottom line kind of reasoning for how the what would appear to be a gross approximation actually can be rather good for something as inhomogeneous as a neon atom. And approved approximations are designed to work much better for systems that are anisotropic and very different from the homogeneous gas. But th this is just another uh, way of seeing what's not given. It's these cone sham uh, approach does not give the actual correlation. It only contains information that's embedded in the functional and and does not describe the actual wave functions of the real system or the actual correlation in the real system. But it can be really good for what it's designed for, the density and the energy of the actual system you want to deal with. So I want to give just a couple of examples. It's, it's, uh, there's just so much work that's been done that I just choose the to say that um, I just can't deal with it well enough and would, would feel that it's much better to try to understand a few things and get, and get a picture of how this is, has uh, come about. So here's perhaps the first real application of density functional theory to a solid. It was done by Maritzen Williams, who were at the IBM Research Center where they had the uh, IBM computers in the 1970s, and it was truly astounding. This is the entire series of transition metals, and this is the energy as a function of volume for for uh, this this series uh, of of 3D and 4D um, transition metals, and this is just absolutely different from anything that could have been done before. There was just never anything before that even came close to this level of accuracy. And now you can start looking at things like in the middle of the transition series, there's a little difference between the calculations and the, the, um, uh, and the actual experimental values uh, for the uh, equilibrium volume. And that little difference turns into a much bigger difference for the uh, cohesive energy or for the bulk modulus. And now we, we see the, that, that how much you've gotten and, and uh, the, the bit there is to go. These are the systems that are most magnetic and you get an effects that are uh, hardest to approximate. Perhaps even more influential was the work in the 1980s by Yin and Cohen, and, and uh, I did some work on this in the 80s too, that was, that it was very similar. Uh, and it showed that you could get the difference between two systems that were really very different, silicon and diamond structure and silicon and metallic beta 10 structure, which is, which uh, is you can form under pressure. So as it turns out, the local density approximation um, gives the pressure a little too low because the energies are the relative energy of the beta 10 um, structure to, compared to the diamond structure is too small. And the improved approximations um, are, are all sort of converge on answers that are uh, much better um, and more in, in agreement with the experiment. I'll say something about that in just a moment. 
And the uh, another example was silicon dioxide, where the local density approximation gives the wrong answer. It would uh, predict that uh, window glass or ordinary crystalline quartz would would actually be unstable to formation of a denser structure, even if it's at zero pressure. It's only under pressure that you actually stabilize such a, a state of, of, of uh, SiO2 in, a, in a, what's called the stichiovite structure. And, and uh, the newer functionals do, you know, do much better. And for both of these actions, it turns out, the experiments, uh, the theory leads the experiment. And it's because in the, the uh, experiments, the, the transitions are not reversible. And so the numbers are not so well pinned down, and even in silicon, and much more so in silicon dioxide. An example of where theory, as it has improved, is actually leading experiments in many ways. Here's an example that led experiments. The, the more recent, uh, the recent DFT calculations for the hydrogen sulfide superconductors that are at the time and still uh, almost the highest TC superconductors known anywhere. Um, the, the, and the predictions for the, for the structure and for the superconducting transition temperature were, were uh, ahead of the experiments. So, so one of the things that was not known was what's the structure, even what's the composition. So it, at ordinary pressure, you know that the, the, the lowest energy structure for, for hydrogen and, and sulfur is uh, H2S. However, when you go up in pressure, the experimentalists really didn't know at, uh, at first what was the actual structure and what was the composition. So on, if you calculate the, the enthalpies of the different compositions, this, it was found that above around 100 GPA, the uh, or above a 40, the stable structure was uh, H3S, and, and above 100 uh, GPA, um, the system uh, would decompose to H3S, uh, no matter what the composition was, you'd get H3S, uh, either excess hydrogen or excess sulfur, but H3S is what you would get. And this, um, uh, under pressure, no matter what you started with, no matter which composition you started with. And the structure was, uh, was quite simple, in fact. And so it's just a marvelous example of, of predictions from theory. So the, that was simple structures. The thing that allowed the, the um, density functional theory to be applied to complicated systems was the car perinello method that allowed you to move the nuclei around, find the equilibrium structures, deal with very complicated problems, liquids. This, um, it, it opened the windows for much more uh, applications. And it opened the windows for new developments too. The exact method that was used by Karin Paranello was, is not used now, but it, but it uses the, the clever methods that are used now, the fast Fourier transforms and iterative methods that have stimulated the advances in all of the methods that are, that are used nowadays. I see that I'm really kind of using a little bit too much time, so, so I'll go just a little faster. Here's, here's something I was involved in, and uh, 1989, Julia Gali, who had worked with Car and Parallel, with, with the uh, uh, doing molecular dynamics came to the University of Illinois, where we had the, the, uh, the biggest computers uh, available to any university people uh, in the world. And we did calculations for carbon uh, in this in liquid state at, at very high temperatures and pressures. And um, because we knew that it worked rather well for diamond and graphite, we knew that it would work well uh, for these more, much more difficult problems, and and it does. More uh, recent experiments in just the last few years have have agreed r remarkably well with this prediction of the uh, transitions between solid diamond and, and liquid uh, uh, liquid carbon 
and um, uh, the transitions to, to other structures at high pressure. Even um, things like polymerization with one of the famous uh, reactions that's used, uh, in, you know, very important commercially for, for producing the plastic bags that you use was done by uh, using the car and parallel method. Um, I've made a, uh, a challenge this year to see how much is it actually used. And here's uh, work in Science Magazine this year, you know, the magazine for all areas of science. And at least half the issues that I surveyed this summer were uh, mentioned density functional. Here's one that I just happened to look at because I said, well, what is a flow battery? And trying to understand what, what's, uh, you know, what is it? And it was really nice to find that their density functional theory calculations of a series of the molecules derivatives suggest that it's, it's really uh, heartwarming to see that essentially uh, a large fraction of the work on anything that involves materials is, is uh, uses theory combined with the experiment. So, and in, now let's turn to things that have been improve the, the uh, density functional theory. And it's been organized nicely by uh, John Perdue in this Jacob's Ladder, you know, going essentially steps on the way to the heaven of, of uh, the, the exact functional. At the bottom are the functions of density, which is the uh, starting with the local density approximation already suggested by Cohen and Jam. Uh, and what's called a meta GDA for using a kinetic energy density that depends on the wave functions and other approximations that depend on the wave functions. They like the Hartree, uh, excuse me, the hybrid functionals that use Hartree-Fock and uh, or uh, DFT plus U that adds uh, repulsion on selected orbitals. Uh, and even ones that depend on the polarization that depends on the uh, unoccupied orbitals as well. So this is actually still in the sense of the original cone jam idea because the orbitals are determined by the density. So it really is a, still a density functional idea. But, but what's different is that the cone jam potential is not limited to a, a, a simple local potential, but it's an orbital dependent kind of potential. And the, the, um, and that is then makes a model for for this exchange correlation functional in terms of these orbitals. Uh, so I think the big advance with hybrid functionals was the, the band gap problem. Here's what was the problem. And I was one of the ones that said, cone jam um, uh, was not meant to give uh, band gaps right. And it doesn't, like with germanium, the, it turns out to be a metal. Hartree-Vock was viewed as a, is a great approximation and it gives band gaps that are much too large. And so one might just stop and say, well, wasn't supposed to be given by density functional theory. But in fact, with the improved functionals, here's the kind of results. The dots are experiment and the lines are what's given by this um, uh, HSE hybrid functional. If you look at the very large numbers of compounds, this is one of these plots where experiment is plotted on the horizontal axis and theory on the vertical axis. And if the if there was perfect agreement, if the answers would be along this 45 degree line. So all the, the functionals that use um, the density only are much too low. And the ones that use hybrids are much, much better. Here's an example of germanium, uh, which was a metal in the local density approximation. And it's much better in these newer functionals. So this is the kind of thing that's, that is now becoming the standard for, for, uh, of, you know, for, for work with density functionals. Uh, e even though we know that the total energies are very useful for these um, 
uh, just density functionals and in GGAs, even though we know the band gaps are not so good, they're still extremely useful. And uh, But if we want to get good band gaps and all, then we need to go to the hybrid functionals. Uh, I just want to say one more thing. Um, I just want to mention it with one example. There's another approach that's uh, use, that's generalized the cone sham approach to time-dependent phenomena. Now, previously it was bands which have to do with adding and subtracting electrons, but suppose you wanted something like the optical absorption, which promotes electrons, then Runge and Gross in 1984 made a rigorous theory, you know, just as rigorous as the cone sham approach uh, that describes such things in principle as a function of the density. It's just as rigorous, but it's more difficult to actually uh, put into practice. But in a finite system, the, it's actually a current functional theory, and in a finite system, you can turn it into a density functional theory using the continuity equation of, of current and density, that the time derivative of, the, of a density is the divergence of a current. Uh, um, and recent developments uh, have made, you know, new functionals uh, make it much more, much better than the first approximations. And now it's really very much used in the chemistry community for molecules. It's, it's a great advance and it's uh, very much a part of all the, the codes used in chemistry. But it wasn't used very much for, for uh, solids because it didn't give much uh, improvements over just using the good old eigenvalues from the cone sham problem. Even though those eigenvalues were, were and, and, and those eigenvalues were not meant to be accurate and they're not. Here's, so I want one example of the great advance that's now done for solids recently. This may be a little messy, but, but here's the point. If you do time-dependent density functional theory for solids, you don't improve the, the, the gap problem one bit. You still need to, to use something like a hybrid functional in order to get the gaps reasonably right. And then when you do the time-dependent version, then it doesn't make all that much difference in materials like gallium arsenide. It improves the agreement with the optical spectra, but but really, these are just quantitative improvements. But if you go to a, a, a system like lithium fluoride, that's where the optical properties are just dominated by, the, by a huge exciton that's below the band gap. With the, with the uh, functionals like LDA, you don't get this at all. You, this is the LDA with the band gap that's way too small and nothing about a high. Um, an exciton, and but with these improved functionals and time-dependent um, um, density functional theory, then it's actually rather well described, and we have uh, enormous advances in how we can deal with optical properties of solids nowadays. So, the conclusions, and I say to this point because I would like to mention some uh, some more in just a moment. So, the cone jam theory has really revolutionized the theory of condensed matter. It's, it's made things possible, and now a, the, uh, the, the recent developments have made things more understandable by using uh, uh, what insightful theoretical arguments, and it's made it more useful in, in a practical sense, so that now theory and experiment go together in solving uh, problems, but it's there's still issues, and the challenge that we have is to apply this to interesting problems in a way that we understand what's going on. So I'd like to pause for a moment and see if there's some questions on this part of the problem, uh, but I want to give you a hint of what's next. What's what I'd like to get to, uh, if people are interested in, is well, what about systems that we call strongly correlated, like mon insulators, for example? I'd like to, to get to that um, if there's some time. Okay, I'd love to get some um,
comments or questions at this point. Okay, Professor Richard Martin, thank you very much for your excellent talk. I'll ask everybody to turn on their microphones for a round of applause in retribution for this wonderful moment. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Okay, uh, we already have uh, some questions, uh, Professor, but uh, before that, let me give you a, a, a panorama of uh, what have been your audience. Uh, so uh, let me tell you that uh, we have people from all the Brazilian five regions, so from the top in the Amapá and Pará, the north uh, region. Uh, so we have people from northeast, like the states of Ceará, Maranhão and Paraíba. We have people from the center, uh, center west region, uh, states like Goiás, Mato Grosso, and the capital of Brazil, Brasilia. Uh, we have people from the southeast, obviously, from Espírito Santo, Minas Gerais, Rio de Janeiro, São Paulo, all the four states. Uh, we have people also from the extreme south of Brazil, from uh, states like Paraná and Santa Catarina. Uh, we have obviously the grad, graduate students, postdocs, teachers, uh, and professors from uh, Pará University, uh, like uh, Professor Angela Caltau and Valdomiro Pascoal Jr. But we have not only people from Belém. Pará is already a huge state, bigger than some countries in the world, right? <laughs> so we have uh, people not only from Belém, but from other cities like Ananindeua, Bragança, uh, Castanhal, Marabá, Sori, Tucuruí. I know these names are a little strange for you, but these are the names of our cities here in Pará. So uh, we have uh, people from uh, other institutions other than uh, Pará University. We have uh, from the uh, Federal Institute, uh, uh, like Professor Marcelo Ribeiro, uh, Rodrigo Gerstein and Tarcísio Filho from Unifesp. And we have uh, students, uh, teachers, professors, researchers, from many institutions all around Brazil. I'm, I wish I could mention all of them, but just to mention some of them, we have Alex Antonelli from Unicamp, Alexandre Haile Horsher from uh, IFT in Sao Paulo, Angelisa Cleves from Santa Catarina, Edson Zacarias in Giorgio Torrieri from Unicamp, Marcelo Siqueira from Unifap, Rodolfo Casana Maranhão, Rodrigo Capaz uh, today at Lab Nano, uh, Satish Kuma VH from Unirio, Silvio Salinas from uh, uh, University of Sao Paulo, but all, all, also people from abroad. We have, uh, we have students uh, attending from abroad, they are local students that are doing their sandwich PhDs, like Haroldo Lima uh, uh, in Aveiro, Portugal. We have Anderson Janotti and Matheus Bazan attending from uh, Newark, Delaware, in the United States. We have Heike Hepper and Professor Oli Eriksson from Uppsala University in Sweden. We have Natalia Lemmy from the Netherlands. So, as you can see, uh, many people from many different places, and uh, we are obviously very happy for that. Uh, so, let me start to, uh, from the questions in this virtual room, so maybe people can ask the questions themselves. So, uh, we have uh, the first question registered here is from Albert Bittencourt. Albert, I don't know if you want to turn on your microphone and make the question yourself. I don't know if you're attending from Sergipe in the in the north uh, uh, northeast, or if you're attending from from the south of Brazil. Uh, so I'll ask uh, Albert's question myself, right? So he says, uh, Professor Risha, thank you uh, very much for your informative presentation. I have a question. At this point, uh, is the advancement of electronic structure calculations most limited, limited by the current level of the theory itself or by computational resources? Oh, I would say um, by, by the theory itself. Of course, computational resources is, is, um, is difficult. It depends on uh, how how much the uh, how difficult the the problem is in terms of, of complexity the uh, so uh, i think there's a good rule of thumb that that one can use and that's been uh, valid for years and years it would be the weekend how much can you accomplish on a weekend um, in fact uh, there's a wonderful quote from figner and sites that that um, they did calculations for five wave functions and each one took uh, two afternoons. So with computers, we'll get bigger and bigger, but, and we'll, just, we'll, we'll see what, uh, uh, you know, 
we'll be able to solve more and more problems. But the big issue is the theory itself. Okay. So uh, thank you, Albert, for your question. Thank you, Professor Richard, for your answer. And uh, now the next question from, comes from Rio de Janeiro, Satish Kumar VH. Satish, do you want to make the question yourself or do you want me to read it? He has originally written for me to read it, so I'll just obey that. So he, uh, thanks uh, for walking us through 120 years of physics, Professor Richard. At very high temperatures, uh, should we consider the relativistic contribution? I wonder if DFT is still valid there. Put differently, uh, can we use quantum field theory to calculate the same? Oh, that's a good question. And, and, and in fact, there's some excellent work using density functionals uh, for, for high temperature. And it, you know, at high enough temperature, it gets simpler uh, because the structure becomes less important. And um, in a way, it becomes simpler. Uh, but the, the functionals then uh, uh, become different because you really have to use the effect of temperature. And there's some excellent work using um, the you know relativistic effects at, at very high temperatures. I'm afraid I don't have the references on the top of my head, but there's uh, 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 work that I could easily get the references for, and um, and some of the ideas we use in nuclear physics for you know for nuclei. So so it is something that can really be applied to other fields. Okay, so uh, thank you, Satish, for your question. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your answer. Uh, before we move to the next question, let, just, let me just uh, read some comments in the chat. So, Elio Gabriel uh, is uh, from Pará University student, undergraduate student. Great webinar. Uh, Luciano da Costa, congratulations, Professor Richard Martin. Uh, mm -hmm. Angelisa Klebisch from Santa Catarina, congratulations, Professor Martin. Uh, Mara Cardoso Machado, Professor Richard, thanks you for your uh, uh, Great webinar. Uh, and now let me move to the next question that comes from uh, Rodrigo Capaz, that is, is speaking, I believe, from Sao Paulo. Rodrigo, do you want to make the question yourself? Please? Yes, I, I, can, I can read my question. Thank you, Cristino. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Martin, for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I have actually more of a comment uh, uh, on your historical uh, digression and that uh, you, fo of course, you focused uh, on DFT, which is actually uh, uh, quite yeah understandable, but uh, uh, I would say that uh, uh, the development of uh, ab initial pseudopotentials in the late 70s and the 80s were uh, actually a key step in the development of, uh, uh, of, being, of uh, providing the ability of uh, doing calculations in, in realistic systems. And, and this is, was perhaps not only a technical development, but also based on the uh, physical principles. So, uh, uh, could you comment on this statement? Do you agree with that? Um, well, it, it's, I, I overemphasized, I'm sure, the historical part. I, I would just like people to know that, that there was this excellent work of um, uh, Fermi made a model potential, and he actually had exactly the same figure in two papers. Now, uh, one had to do with electrons uh, scattering from, from atoms, and the other had to do with, with uh, neutrons uh, scattering from nuclei. And uh, so the general idea of a model potential had been around. That means something complicated going on down inside a certain region, and you replace it by model potential. Hellman uh, did something that was very close to, to the modern way of doing things it says that, that that would say in principle I, I know exactly what's the solution to many electrons in the uh, in in a local region and I'm going to uh, capture that by a pseudo potential that I can then carry over to, to other systems uh, so then that's certainly not to minimize what was actually done later, because what's done later was to, to give give it, uh, you know, just a very pretty, uh, useful form that's that's now, you know, if, like the carb Perinello method would have never happened if it hadn't had simplifications of pseudopotentials. 
So thank you. It, it's a good thank point, you. and I don't mean to minimize what's done more sure. recently. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Martin. Uh, uh, we have uh, also more comments here. Uh, Matthew Josario, congratulations, uh, uh, Professor Richard. He uh, is speaking from uh, Mail Josario from São Carlos, São Paulo. Professor Ole Eriksson from Uppsala. Uh, maybe you would like to make a comment, uh, Ole. Yes, uh, uh, of course. Uh, very nice talk, Richard. Uh, very nice to to um, <laughs> get the historical uh, uh, perspective to things. I I, I just uh, I, I think the the functional that 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 you were thinking about that included relativistic effects. I think they were by Ramana and Rayagopal uh, once upon a time. And we others tested them, but in the end uh, they were not so so um, uh, important. They did not have so much effect on the things that we were interested in, in, in those days at least. But uh, I, I think it was from Ramana Raigapal in the 80s, I think they derived those functions. Okay. And, and there's nice also some, some work by Hardy Gross and uh, some other people in Germany that I can't really remember exactly who. That was, you know, pretty. And then I think was was an important... That's Vig Vignale, I think, was involved in that work also. Vignale and Gross, I think. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ole. Uh, thank you, Professor Richard Martin. So, Professor, I think it's time for you to compliment for you just uh, left us with the flavor of, but uh, you said that uh, uh, it would be a good idea to, to mention that in the end, the, your, your last slides. I mean, would you, would you like to? I'd be happy to. Uh, yes, is, please. Are my slides shown right now? Uh, you have to go to the PowerPoint. So just click over the PowerPoint again to the to the no 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 to, uh, to oh, the left oh, yes. to the uh, you, vertical. You know yes right. yes okay yes perfect okay. perfect. So if you and want then, to go to the full screen mode, uh, that will be all uh, right. Okay, oh, sorry, just wait sorry. a moment. Yeah yeah. yeah 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 perfect. Okay perfect now. Okay. Perfect. Thank you for thank you for guiding me. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, okay so. Uh, the reason I want to mention strongly correlated systems is that this is the area where often it has been stated that density functional theory fails. Uh, so, and, and it was the, the idea of this statement made that's often made is that it's not just that it wasn't inaccurate, it was that it fails. And now the same, uh, People, I shouldn't say that. I'm not criticizing the people at all. The, the, at the same time, uh, it's it's known that for something like the copper oxides, the structure is given remarkably well by density functional theory, and the the bands that are that are used or you know, the basis for the Hubbard model come right out of density functional theory. Uh, however, the the final result. Of, of the properties of the materials are very difficult to describe. And let's look at, at, at whether some, something fails, where we really need to do something different, fundamentally different, or where it's just an inaccuracy issue or a difficulty issue. How can we distinguish between things that are difficult and things that are impossible or require something else? So, that's, there's two kind of guiding principles that I would like to use. Whoops, I actually didn't mean to show that. <laughs> so it, conclusions from observations of materials and phenomena, the, the ones that are called strongly correlated, are, are these are interesting results. And let's look at, at just the observations. What, what is important? And we haven't talked about temperature, uh, almost. We didn't talk about it very much uh, in density functional theory. And that's because it's hard to put in the effects of temperature. But if you look at, at uh, what's called strongly correlated systems, you, you'll find that it's very important. You know, like in magnetism, it's the, the um, what's modeled as disorder of spins is it's very temperature dependent and, and gives a reasonable model interpretation of 
of the ordered magnetic states and the um, and the uh, Curie temperature, but you don't see many calculations that 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 deal with this directly in density functional theory. Does that mean it can't do it, or does that mean it's hard to do? Phase transitions. Now, phase transitions are important in more than one sense, and um, and uh, that provides a particular um, uh, twist on the the uh, idea of temperature and 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 uh, and interactions between electrons, which I want to come back to in a moment. There's another way of thinking about guiding principles. Let's look at basic principles that would come from theory and theoretical formulations. The basic uh, uh, points that I would li like to make come ultimately from conservation laws and continuity. Uh, I've, I was, uh, I have a nice uh, quote from Alex uh, Abrikasov about what Landau thought about when developing Fermi liquid theory. And it was basically what evolves continuously from systems that we can understand and, and then we can describe in terms of their properties uh, using independent particle concepts modified to, to deal with strongly correlated systems. Here's um, uh, an example of the of basic principles, like metals versus insulators. That's much of our discussion of, of strongly correlated systems. But really, it's a dis rigorous distinction only at zero temperature. At non-zero temperature, you have good conductors and bad conductors. And that's very interesting. But there's a rigorous distinction only at t equals zero. If you talk about band gaps and Fermi surfaces, they're very well defined only at t equals zero. And, and one can think of, uh, the, one can emphasize that Band gaps and Fermi surfaces are not independent particle concepts, which uses a different way of, of thinking about continuity, and uh, which I wanted to, to do on the next slide. Phase transitions, on the other hand, make rigorous distinctions that apply uh, at t equals zero or t not equal to zero, and that's in terms of order, a diff uh, some type of order. So let's use, uh, let's proceed with an example of theoretical analysis. And here's the one that I think is, is uh, most understandable and, and most powerful, the Luttinger theorem. Now what this says is that the volume of the Fermi surface is conserved. As interactions are turned on, that means going from non-interacting system where, where we know exactly what is the Fermi surface to an interacting system uh, where where we have uh, uh, where we don't have exact solutions, and the statement is that the volume is exactly the same. But let's be careful. That is only at t equals zero. Well, in fact, the Fermi surface is only precisely known, or just this um, it only exists in a precise sense at t equals zero. And it's not really a theorem. That's just a, a name given to it. It's, it's a result derived by summing diagrams. And of course, such a sum is not guaranteed to converge. So does that mean we just throw out the Luttinger theorem and, and say, well, it doesn't work when we get to, to something difficult? Uh, that's, uh, but I think the right way to look at it is interesting if it does not converge. If, if the, the Luttinger theorem seems to not apply, that means it's something interesting to look at and to look for. So here's the, exa the one example I want to give, and then I'd be delighted to talk about others if anybody's interested. The original example of a mod insulator was nickel oxide in the 1930s, and then in fact, Mott discussed it in the 1930s, but 
the in 1949 was the, the way he stated it in a way that's that's my most acceptable, most useful today. And it was the observation that any system of atoms um, with large Coulomb interactions on the atoms that would be larger than the bandwidth between, you know, of electrons hopping between the atoms should be an insulator. It, it just makes sense. Even if there's an odd number of electrons per cell, the, uh, the, the electrons would just be prohibited from hopping from one site to another. And, and of course, in, for independent electrons, we know for sure that an odd number of electrons per cell must be fractionally field bands and must be a metal. So is that a violation of the Lettinger theorem? On the face of it, it is. But if you look more closely, the electron has spin and there's some degrees of freedom involved. And I propose that many, or maybe most, or maybe all, so-called mod insulators have some kind of order at low temperature. Uh, so the example that actually applies for nickel oxide is antiferromagnetism, where the where the unicell is doubled. And the, it's not a violation of the Lettinger theorem. It was something that says you should look more closely. Here's the example that I gave before of band gaps for uh, uh, systems in density functional theory and the, the fact that, that modern uh, 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 hybrid functionals uh, give gaps pretty well. I didn't point it out on the previous slide, but let's look at nickel oxide and manganese oxide. The so-called mod insulators that are strongly correlated, they're really not so different. Uh, once you do the calculation in the ordered structure, it's more difficult, and which you can see by the fact that it's almost a metal in the, in the local density. Both of them are almost metals in the local density approximation, and both of them have large gaps in reality. So the, the, um, the, the fact uh, is that, that they are more difficult. And that's a sign of, of um, in something interesting, but, but they're, they're not fundamentally different from the other systems. Uh, what was different was that at high temperatures, above the nail temperature, where nickel oxide is not ordered, it's not an antiferromagnet, it still acts like an insulator. Uh, it means it's low conductivity. And it means that if you look at the electronic spectrum, it looks very much like there's a gap and, and et cetera, et cetera. But what I wanted to point out is this is not a fundamental problem. This is the question is what do you get at the high temperatures? And you shouldn't expect a, a density functional theory that's derived for T equals zero and assumes that that the, the disordered state is, is just as if it were it at uh, t equals zero, it's, of course that doesn't work. It's a difficult problem, not a fundamental problem. And suppose you actually want to deal with nickel oxide uh, at a high temperature above the NAO temperature. How could you actually do it? Well, there's a way. Dynamical mean field theory is exactly the, the logical approach to proceed. Dynamical mean field theory is, is uh, based on the idea of treating the, the interacting, there, point to this point, a site and treating the interacting system on that site very accurately in the uh, uh, a bath that's described by average properties of the, the system that's around it. This is a generalization of the vice mean field, where, where the, the spin on a site uh, uh, is, feels the effects of the spins on the other sites. And if you uh, cool down the system from some high temperature where everything is random, the, it, 
uh, as there's a phase transition to an ordered state at lower temperature. And uh, if, if you actually do the dynamical mean field theory uh, and use parameters from the density functional theory, which is actually essentially the state of the art nowadays, it, from one point of view, it can be considered as a very powerful extension of dynamical mean field, or mean field theory to, to uh, non-zero temperatures. And now I don't want to put this down. It's, it's doing a marvelous job. It, it puts in more than just temperature. It puts in uh, correlations in a way that's, uh, that's uh, extremely useful. But, but it's the idea of, of what, what do you do? If, uh, if you see something that you know from basic facts that it's not a fundamental problem, it's a difficult problem and, and proceeding. And now the dynamical mean field theory is, is the kind of thing that's useful in many, many contexts. And, and, and um, if there were time, I would be, uh, I love giving further examples. So the conclusion at this point is that we recognize that the Cohen-Sham density functional theory has revolutionized what we can do. And because it's revolutionized what we can do, we, we can apply it to very difficult problems. But now the problem is the theory. What, can, what do we know with confidence from, from the, those calculations? And what do we know that we would have to do to, to make them treat the problems of systems that are just genuinely more difficult and more interesting. Uh, the, the guiding principles is what I propose is, is the most important thing to know, not the details, but the guiding principles of what should you be able to get and what, what, what indicates something really interesting going on. So the real challenge then to you, to me, to all of us, is to solve interesting problems. The mod insulators, heavy fermions, superconductors, and topological systems, uh, new materials and phenomena yet to be discovered. Okay, I'd like to stop again, and I'd like to stop for the uh, this part and to stop you know, my main presentation. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, I would like to tell you that, uh, I mean, uh, it's been a huge pleasure to listen to you, and uh, I'd like to let you know that uh, although it's not my field, but we have in the house your book, right, because my wife is obviously from your field, and just to, to let you know, I mean, she became very, very happy when I told her as a surprise that you accepted to give a talk to us. So uh, I think this is the feeling of the Brazilian community and everybody that is attending to your talk. And uh, before the final round of applause, let me just mention two things. So uh, there's a last question, and maybe if you allow me to, to make to, to ask you to say a few words more about. But before, uh, so let me start with a question come from Alex Bittencourt. So uh, he asks, Professor Richard, uh, could you please comment on the rise of machine learning? and how it can contribute mm. to the study of electronic properties? And do you think that algorithms will be able to fill the gaps in the ab initio theory? Oh, yes, this is really, uh, <laughs> um, the, the, you know, a wonderful question and a wonderful thing to be uh, addressing right now. Uh, so for the young people in the audience, I, I really recommend that you pay attention. Uh, I think this, this says, two things. Um, one is addressing the useful side. Um, the Using the um, artificial intelligence ideas and machine learning to, to uh, use uh, the, the databases that are originally derived often by density functional theory and using them to, to uh, understand and apply to uh, more, compli more complicated systems. Uh, uh, in general, way beyond what what we can do directly on the computer, but I think the question was really more the uh, could we could we understand the theory better? And and I must say that's uh, that's an exciting possibility that you could use uh, 
like the many body calculations and use more information than just the density and and the energy that comes out of them use use information on the correlations themselves uh, to to build better functionals and and to you know to go forward and perhaps build better approaches that that by pulling out patterns that would exist in 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 systems uh, not just patterns of functionality but patterns of 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 you know, what's going on in this many body sense in, uh, you know, in, in actual materials and in model systems. So thanks for the good question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Robert, uh, for your question. Uh, so uh, 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 I have some comments here in the chat. So uh, Angela Claudal uh, just mentioned, thank you, Professor Martin, for your wonderful talk, and also Valdomiro Pascual, they are both professors at uh, uh, Pará University. Congratulations for your amazing talk. And uh, Professor Ole Eriksson would like to make a comment. Please, please, Professor Ole. Okay. Yeah, I, um, I have to say I was uh, very pleased to, to um, hear you uh, mentioning dynamic and mean field theory. And, and, and I, I share your, your feeling that it is a very uh, important development for, for the correlated electron systems. And, and um, I'm also very enthusiastic about it, and, and I think in particular it, it is good because it allows for multi-configurational effects. So you, all of a sudden you can start describing the wave functions, not just like a single slated determinant, but li linear combinations of many different slated determinants and have multi-configurational features, and it, it's, a, it's absorbed in the self-energy. I think uh, it's something that our community has been searching for for a long time, and finally we have it. I think it's actually... Truly great. I, I'm very nice. I'm very happy that you also recognize this. Uh, uh, I'm glad. I'm glad that you mentioned this. Thank you very much. Good. Uh, let me just say that uh, I did, I meant to mention it in this short way to and not to to uh, uh, what uh, to pull it out to say that it's important, just like you said, but also to say that it's understandable. Uh, you know, don't yes, be afraid yes. when you go to those papers and then you get. Uh, uh, quantum field theory and you get you know stuff that's that uh, where the details are pretty difficult the ideas are 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 something you could really understand yeah. and, and and not be afraid of right good thank you very much okay, okay thank you thank you professor Uli. thank you professor richard martin uh, uh here there's a, a another question in in the chat so uh it comes from eliel marcelino Eliel, do you want to make the question yourself? Yeah, yeah, no, pro not a problem. I, I can do it, Professor. Please. Uh, Professor Richard, th thanks for the for this uh, precious <laughs> presentation. Uh, actually, my 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 question is regarding to the uh, HSE hybrid fun functional. Uh, uh, what what's the improvement 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 level uh, uh, compared to the to the LDA and Hertree Fock? When we analyze the, these these two te techniques in separate, is there any uh, improvement left that we can compare uh, regarding to the HSE hybrid fu functional? Not sure if, if I'm clear. Well, let's see. I'm not sure I quite understand that. Um, I'm uh, there is uh, uh, you know papers that have uh, what uh, you know extensive uh, studies of materials comparing with with uh, the um, uh, other functionals, and so comparing things like the the band gaps and the uh, total energies and uh, uh, bulk moduli and all that sort of thing. Um, so, and, and I don't know how to summarize them any simple way. Uh, I would like to emphasize, you know, what is the functional, uh, and what it is 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 the the, the fact that Hartjevac gives you trouble. It was, it's known, that was uh, what uh, Barnegie did in 1935, that it just kills the Fermi surface and the metal. Uh, the Fermi surface is wiped out um, and, and has zero weight uh, because of the divergence of the Coulomb interaction. So HSC uh, made a, a, a short range uh, interaction and and uh, turn that into a functional 
And then that function will apply to metals and solids and, uh, you know, and insulators as well. So it's, it was a, a set of ideas that's really worth trying to understand and then trying to understand uh, why it's useful. All right, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Even my, my question was not that clear. You made it all clear for me. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Elio, for your question. Uh, thank you, Professor Richard, for your answer. So we have people writing in the chat. Vanessa Amorim uh, wrote that uh, she's very happy to participate in this webinar. And uh, Lucas Bandera, uh, uh, right, thank you very much for your presentation. It's a pleasure to attend your talk. And uh, so uh, to conclude, Professor, maybe if you would like to uh, say some some words about the U.S. Africa project that you have been participated in, because this is something that, uh, so you know, uh, in Latin America, we have uh, situations in which uh, science uh, uh, needs a lot of improvement. And it will be a pleasure to, to listen to you say some words about that. Ah, okay. So uh, now I realize that I it would be great if I put up s s some of the or if I had available some of the uh, graphics uh, that would uh, show some of the uh, you know the things that are so rewarding. Um, this African school has been going for twelve years now, and it's developed a a network of of people in sub-Saharan Africa. That's uh, that's uh, you know capable in, in our area, and the reason for for choosing this this approach was that uh, the electronic structure methods have become useful and they're understandable and and it's a small enough field to develop a, a whole network of people that have common interest and and a network of people that can deal with many other problems in chemistry and. You know, like in a, at a small university, to work together with physicists and chemists, you know, is really very, very useful. And and uh, I view the work in Brazil as as uh, quite advanced, and you know, excellent work in Brazil, and and uh, where we where we already at the point of uh, very good interactions between U.S. and Brazilian physicists. And it would be great to have a new initiative to make it greater, and and uh, to uh, uh, to make you know multiple connections uh, between scientists in different countries. Uh, uh, you know, uh, congratulations on the good work that's in Brazil already, and I encourage you to make connections across the Atlantic to Africa and and three-way connections with the United States and Europe and. Etc. Okay, Professor. So uh, with that, I think we can uh, conclude. But before that, uh, let me ask everybody to turn on their microphones on again and once again for a huge round of applause in retribution for this wonderful moment that we spent together. Thanks to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. All the best. Keep safe. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. I'm going to leave this up because bye. this is one that I, I chose not to do. I don't like to advertise so much, but I'm going to, if anybody is interested in these, these books, I'm going to advertise them a little bit right now. Go ahead, please. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to leave this up. Uh, the, the, the ones on the left are the basic density functional theory, and the ones on the right are deal with the GW approximation and dynamical mean field theory and quantum Monte Carlo, and and contain more of the descriptions of of you know what I regard as the basic principles for dealing with these uh, you know difficult problems. Perfect, Professor. Thank you very much. Who knows, one day to have it all also translated to Portuguese. <laughs> it will uh, be great. <laughs> OK. OK, Professor. Thank you. Thank, okay. you. Thank you very Thank much you once very again. Thank you for the opportunity. I OK. Appreciate. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. All the best. Bye.